All right. When you when you're ready, let's let's get underway. I'm, I'm absolutely ready. Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Aquarius Podcast. My special guest today is Stephen Clapham. He's returning for his second go around. He's got a brand new book. It's called The Smart Money Method. He'll give us the full title in a moment right after this. Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Aquarius Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Aquarius Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquires Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit AcquiresFunds.com. G'day, Steve. How are you? I'm fine, and thank you so much for having me on. How are you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm very well, thanks. Just so, so just hold up your book cover and tell everybody the title so they can find it if they're hunting for it. So the book is called The Smart Money Method, How to Pick Stocks Like a Hedge Fund Pro. And I was laughing about this because I think it's a very American marketing sort of title. It's just not me. But it, my my guy, Joseph, who does the copywriting, came up with the title and the publisher loved it. The working title was called The Effective Equity Analyst, which was what I can't see you selling a lot of those ones. Wouldn't sell very many copies, we decided. <laughs> but you're, 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 uh, you are a hedge fund pro of, of, the, uh, of the old school who likes to do some forensic accounting analysis. So is that what folks are going to find in the book? Um, there's a little bit of that. I mean, uh, what I've tried to do is I've tried to make it pretty accessible. You know, the, the trouble is that most investment books are either full of formulae or they're they're, they're sort of anecdotal. And what I tried to do with this was to create a book that people could read that they wouldn't be turned off by, that would also help them improve their investment techniques. And so the book is really designed for the lay investor or people with a bit of experience, but to try and make their research process more professional. And what, what's what's the process that you recommend in the book? What what's the what's is it is it the same one that you employ when you're when you're investing? Yeah, it's exactly what we developed you know, at the hedge funds. So the the process really starts with well, where do you find a stock idea? And you know, I go through. There's lots of places to find a stock idea, so I go through all of them. Um, where do you find then, them? I'm eager, I'm eager to hear that. Where, where, where do you find good ones? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, this is this is quite an interesting thing. So I came up with about, I don't know, 12 or 15 different places you could find stock ideas. And what I say in the book is it's actually very important to try and troll a wide range of places for your ideas. Because if you get all your ideas from your mate who's a hedge fund manager down the pub, then when he starts to underperform, you'll start to underperform. So if even if you just get your ideas down the pub, get them from a range of different people. But I go through, you know, don't don't take a tip in the press. Because one of my old colleagues used to say, if it's in the papers, it's in the price. So don't if you read something in Barron's, I've got no idea if Barron's has got a good track record in, in tipping stocks or not. But the chances of you making outsized returns from following recommendations in a newspaper or a magazine are quite low. So I go through some alternative sources. And there's all sorts of sources. I'm a great believer, uh, like Peter Lynch, in the idea that you use your personal observation. And... Um, just lots of lots of areas just looking around you that you find good ideas and um, you know products that you like can be incredibly effective source of ideas so my wife spends more money than I think anybody else in the UK with our online shopping um, supermarket Ocado and she loves it and so when she says, oh, this is fantastic, you should buy shares in it, I I don't do it. I don't always do as my wife says, but I do go and look at these things. And I think, you know, just finding products that you think, man, that's really good. 
stuff that's related to your own life, stuff that you know about, you're far more likely to have a successful investment if you go into an area that you know. So if you're involved in a particular industry, in a particular field, you have a pretty good idea of who's if, who's who's effective. So, you know, I go through, you know, the different places to find an idea, and I, I start off with finding the idea, and I go through the whole process, ending up with when do you sell? And I think one of the things that both private and professional investors are really bad at is when to sell. Yeah, and, why um, is that? Why, why is it so hard to figure out when to sell? Because you fall in love with the stock. So you, you've you owned the stock, it's been going up, it's done really well for you, and you then fall in love with it. You get to know the management, you feel comfortable with them, you know everything there is to know about it. And I was talking to Claire Levy, who runs Essentia An Analytics, because I'm doing a behavioral finance course so I'm just writing the content for it at the moment. And one of the things she said is that, you know, some very successful investors, when they, because they look at the data, they look at trade data, they look at big hedge funds, big long-term investors, and they can see where people go wrong. And she said, one of the most common things is that people own shares for three years and they've done really, really well, and then they should exit, but they don't because they feel super happy with the, with the stock. They know it, they know the industry inside out. And if they just sold it, then they'd, they'd really maximize their performance. But what often happens is it goes up for three years and then it flatlines relative to the market. And so you've got this sort of unproductive capacity sitting there in your portfolio that you feel very comfortable with, but it's not, it's not working for you. That's an interesting, it's an interesting idea because, you, you know, there's this, idea at the moment never sell have you heard of this um oh yeah so the, it it you know if you've been if you've been a seller for valuation reasons over probably the last say three five years you've basically left money on the table so who's who's right and who's wrong there are the, are the never sell guys wrong in in holding on for that exceptionally long period of time no i i i'm not I'm not saying anybody's anybody's wrong. I'm just this is factual data from a large group of professional investors. I mean, I, you know, it's, I think it's a couple of hundred billion dollars of assets under management, and the, they've got the trade data. And you know, this idea that all these people that we see on Twitter, Toby, that you know, we don't care about valuation. We bought it's a great company. We're going to hold it forever. You know, they're doing really well right now. But when that stops working, it will stop working very badly. And there is no such thing as investment without worrying about valuation. And smarter people than me have sold Amazon before now. And they're looking, they're looking pretty stupid for now. We'll see if they're looking pretty stupid in 12 months' time. The, the fact is that the stock market has been a very unusual um, place for the last well, several years, and valuation hasn't been uh, in, at the forefront of people's minds. Now, look, it's perfectly possible that I'm completely wrong on this and that valuation won't matter for the next 10 years. I mean, interest rates could be negative and people may not care what they pay for equities. That, that is a plausible scenario. I'm, I work on the basis of mean reversion. You know, things don't stay different for that much longer obviously each cycle is different and we've seen that in spades this time but the death of valuation the death of value i could i could kind of understand that philosophy death of valuation i don't think so well let's let's just go back a little bit to the process because i'm sort of interested to know once you you get the hot tip from your mate at the pub or from your wife what's the next step after that well, the Buy next it. step after that, well, the, but the, the thing is, so, you know, what I used to do is I used to always have a lot of um, things on the watch list. And the problem then is you don't want to go away and do an in-depth piece of research on an idea that may or may not be a good one. So my system and the system I recommend in the book is the first stage is what I call testing the hypothesis. 
So I'm looking at a stock. Why am I looking at it? I've got some reason, some hypothesis about it. That, I, that some reason I think it's going to go up, or in the case of the hedge fund, it's going to go down. But for the case of the retail investor, for some reason you're attracted to it and you think that it's going to going to go up. And um, the first stage is to test that hypothesis. Why do you think it's going to go up? And then what I do is I go through the steps, and I reckon that it would take me between 30 minutes and two and a half hours to do this quick review. And I go through all the steps. Now, some of those steps aren't feasible for a private investor, because if you're sitting in a big hedge fund, it's very easy to print off half a dozen research notes. You know, you can do that in five minutes on Bloomberg and you can scan them, and that isn't available to a private investor. But there is research available. There is press cuttings. There's a lot of information in the internet. So I go through the various steps, and one of the, one of the steps is looking at the charts. And I get a lot of flack because I, you know, people, fundamental investors say, well, how can you look at the charts? <laughs> I'm kind of like puzzled why people you know, think this. Um, in fact, one of my colleagues I used to work with said, I don't know why you're wasting your time with the charts. But it's not that I'm, you know, a great chartist and looking at candlestick patterns and reverse flags or anything like that. The bearish harami. Well, <laughs> but I simply look at the chart as a data representation of market psychology. The chart, the share price, is the most informative thing about a stock because it tells you what the market thinks of that stock, and it tells you when the market thought the stock was in favor and when the market thought the stock was out of favor. And by using that, you can then translate why is the market viewed the stock in that way? Because our job isn't just to figure out what's the company really worth. Our job is to figure out what's the company really worth and why does the market not recognize that? Because you only make money if there's a gap between perception and reality. And you've got to understand, well, why is there that gap? and what might happen to close the gap. Now, obviously, over time, if you're right on the reality, the market's perception will turn around. But there may be something fundamental about that stock that means the market may take a long, long time to change its mind. And those are the stocks that you kind of want to avoid because you might be right, the company might do very well, but if the market hates the management and thinks they're crooks, until the management change, people won't, people won't warm to it. So you, that, you've got to understand that gap between perception and reality. And I go through some of the basic quick valuation tests that you can do very quickly to decide, is, the, is this stock worth pursuing? So in my case, as a you know, hedge fund doing special situations, so very deep work on a small number of ideas, this would just be the prelude to actually going and doing very much detailed work. But for a private investor, this might be all you do. So just just to go back to the chart, what are you looking for when you're looking at the, um, that's a nice mug you've got there. I like, I like that. You got, you got that, the, uh, is, that, is, that your, is that your book cover on the mug? Yeah, there's a book cover in the mug. Yeah, I, I, I copied your idea. That's, that's you great. I love it. I saw you at the choir as multiple on your mug. So I thought, that's a very clever idea. I'm, I'm going to do that. I love it. What, what, what are you looking for on the chart? Are you looking for something that's fallen or are you looking for what, are you looking for momentum or how, how, are, you, how are you viewing it? I, I, I'm not looking for anything in particular. I'm just looking to see, you know, it's not that I would buy a stock because it was below or above its moving average or anything like that. I'm simply looking at the chart as a representation of how the market feels about that stock today. And I might well buy a stock that's falling. Remember, I was working at big hedge funds and we were taking big positions. So, you know, once the thing's turned, you can't really buy it. You know, you've got to buy the falling knife you need the liquidity. Um, to make yeah. real money. Um, but, you know, that's not... That's not the case for every position, uh, every place I've been working or every position that, that I was taking. And, you know, so often you might take a small position in something that was actually going up because you thought, well, now the, the, the sentiment's turning. And in my online course, so the, the, the book is basically 
um, I've taken the book and it's the same format and same layout as my online course. And in the online course, we go through this, how do you test the hypothesis? And I just use the example of Procter & Gamble. And, you know, it's obviously it's a big, well-known company. And I just it's an easy thing to, to look at. And um, when I did that, the chart actually had turned around. So P&G then at that point was quite interesting because the share price had gone above where it had been in the last five years. The analysts were still very lukewarm about it. So one of the things I say is look at how many buys and how many sells and how many holds there are. And at the time that I did this, P&G had four buys, 16 holds and one sell. Now sales are very unusual, but that, that profile of 16 holds tells you that the sell side has fallen out of love with the company. Big 16 holds is a very, very low rating by US standards. And so the fact that the shares had turned around in the last six, nine months and had been, actually been very strong told you that the market was changing its mind about PNG. It had been dull for the last five years and got, it just gone traded sideways. And here, there was, people were starting to get interested in it again. That piques my interest. It's not, if it had been, if it carried on falling, I would still have been interested in it because obviously it would have been cheaper. But the, it's just using the chart to tell you about how the market feels. That, I think that's very overlooked and very important. And the other thing I do in that um, initial check is I check who the shareholders are. And understanding who the shareholders are is a really important thing for a private investor. It's less, you know, it's less relevant if you're at a big hedge fund because you've got to be early. So you want to be there before your competition. But if you're a private investor, you don't have to be clever. You just have to ensure that the people that own the shares are people that you respect and like and want to be alongside. Do, do you advocate some sort of like a 13F or the UK version of the 13F to to see who's buying or, or is it you just go to the shareholder registry and you see are, they, are these sort of smart fundamental value investors who are on this uh, shareholder register or, or are they you know, they're just not there, which might be which might be some sort of indication in and of itself. Well, I mean, the the, the U.S. system is fantastic. Now, I really don't understand why they want to change the thresholds for funds reporting their their holdings. That's really um, get rid of all the free step. riders. <laughs> well, I, look, you know, it's the same for everybody. So even if you're sitting in the U.K., you've got to file with SEC. And, you know, there's some very interesting U.K. investors that probably are off the radar in the United States that are really worth following. Give us their but names, Steve. Yeah, let, I mean, let me write down a few names. <laughs> but you, you, know, you know the names, you know. Terry um, Smith. Terry Smith, Chris Hone, um, Nick Train. I mean, there's there's lots of very successful guys in, 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 and ladies in the in the UK. But the you know either using the 13F or following a few people that you like and respect. So in the UK, you don't have to disclose until you're above three percent. So a lot of holdings are opaque. But if you read the fund letters or the presentations or whatever, then you can see that people are buying particular stocks. And then you can ask yourself, well, okay, why do they why do they own these things? But looking at the shareholder register at the start, I mean, obviously, if you've got access to Bloomberg, that data is all, all available at the press of a button. Um, but it's not even that difficult for um, the retail investor, even outside the United States. There's plenty of data sources now. One of my um, favorite type of situations to find, and I haven't seen one for a long time because the market's been so strong, but in sort of the 2013 to 2015 period, there were a lot of companies that had got very expensive in the late 1990s and had gone nowhere for more than a decade and uh, had got cheaper and cheaper over that period of time because the underlying business had remained very, very strong. It's just that they were so expensive in 2000 that it took them that long to work off the overvaluation. So when you find them in 
a decade or so later and the stock price has gone nowhere. There's no volatility in the stock either. So the options become very cheap too. They're very big companies, very good companies, very stable companies, with very cheap sort of call options in there. I don't use it necessarily. It's not a it's not a screen that I use, but I think it's a I like the situation when I find it and I've found quite a few that way. But no, nothing for nothing for a very long time using that method. It's been a the that was Microsoft, right? Microsoft, Microsoft would be a perfect example of that. Walmart was another and, one. Yeah, we have to, well, the, 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 the market, of course, the, the market is, I think, is better today at reading opportunities than it was even 10 years ago. You know, the sophistication and particularly um, the influence of the machines. Right. You know, the algorithms are so prevalent today that anything that's quantitative is actually very difficult to exploit or you have to pay up right so after you've done your you've done your preliminary research and you're satisfied that this is something you want to go forward with what's the next stage in the process well the next stage i mean what i do so i very often come to a situation where it's in unfamiliar territory so it's a, an industry that I haven't looked at or a geography that I haven't looked at before. So what I'd like to do first is to understand the industry. And it saves you quite a lot of time because you also want to understand the company. But understanding the company in the context of the industry, I think, is extremely important. And one of the things I am particularly pay attention to is the relationship of capacity to demand. Now... You'll be very familiar with this, I'm sure, because the, the group here, Marathon Asset Management, not the US Marathon, but the London firm, um, they've written a couple of books. Capital Returns is the, is the one that's in print now. And this was a philosophy that they've espoused for many years. Um, but it's something that, because of my background, one of the industries that I was worked with on the sell side was the transport sector. And in the transport sector, if you're looking at airlines or shipping, there's actually quite a lot of data around and what capacity is doing. And the thing I find quite funny is that everybody gets obsessed about demand. You know, so everybody's obsessed with total addressable market and what demand growth is going to be. Well, demand growth is quite difficult to forecast and you have quite a large range of error. Capacity growth is usually very easy to forecast because there's all sorts of data. There's all sorts of lead time operate in, in many, many industries. So I spend quite a long time starting off looking at a new situation, looking at, well, what's, what's capacity doing? What's it been doing? And what it's, what's it going to do? And if you find a situation in which capacity growth has, has stopped, and you've got you're fairly confident demand growth is going to continue. That is usually a very attractive situation. I mean, often the best situations are ones where people have started to close capacity. So you've got an industry in which demand profile looks terrible. Everybody hates it, and oh, management are starting to get the get the message, and they're starting to to, to close down um, production. Those situations can be very very powerful. And you find that in, and you find that particularly in transport. So you know that the, you know the sort of ships that are coming online. You know how many planes are going to be in the air, and so you can forecast roughly what that's going to look like. And so that's how you're sort of laying your bet. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I used to, when I used to do the airlines. I mean, many times made very, very good at returns. I mean, just short term, you know, three to six month start type of trades. But looking at the amount of capacity in the market, you know, when the when there's too much capacity coming on, then the, the price collapses. And, you know, it, it doesn't take a huge amount of change in the in the price of the, the seat to make a massive dent in the airline profitability. And, you know, when companies miss earnings, there is no prisoners taken. They, <laughs> they go down. And, um, you know, we made lots of money. Um, on the, on the airlines, um, just doing that. It, it's not it's not complicated. I mean, people are more sophisticated now uh, at looking at that, but you can apply it to lots and lots of industries. One of the industries that I used to, to use this for was cement. You know, it takes quite a long time to build a cement plant. 
And in order to build one, you've got to have various planning and, you know, there's all sorts of lead time and there's all sorts of evidence that you're building one. So you can see what's going to happen. And, you know, cement's an in, you know, one of those classic industries is very expensive to transport. So you get areas like Florida where there's, you know, imported cement as competition. But for many areas inland, they, you know, how much capacity there is, you can see if a new plant's being built. And if there isn't, you you know, you you can feel much more confident about, about the demand outlook and about the pricing outlook. So that's very interesting. So you, you get comfortable with the capacity in the industry. And then what's the next stage after that? Well, so I, I just try and build a picture of, of, of the industry. So I try and build a picture. I start with capacity. Of course, I look at demand. What's the past demand growth? What are the demand drivers? Is that are those drivers weakening or strengthening? And then I look at the industry structure. You know, who, where is this company? Where is it in the industry? Who are its competitors? And you know, what I like to do is I say, okay, so who are the winners in this industry, and why have they been winners? So when I get on to looking at the company itself. I start to drill down and say, okay, so this company has been a winner in this industry. Why, why is that? Is it geography? You know, looking at the history is incredibly helpful, incredibly informative because where you've come from informs where you're going. So um, I, I, I like to, to look at that. So the, and the other thing I like to look at is I like to just try and understand the, the quality of the business. So, you know, I prefer to invest in quality um, situations. Unfortunately, when you're a special situations investor, where you've got a very high return threshold that you need to, to exceed, you usually end up buying low quality situations. You buy rubbish because it's cheap and you have a reason for thinking that it's a catalyst that it's going to stop being cheap. Um, but understanding the quality is absolutely essential if you're a private investor because you don't want to own low quality companies because low quality companies require a much greater attention and focus. So you're much better off owning higher quality companies. So I talk quite, there's a whole chapter in the book about how do you assess the quality of the quality of a business. And I then go on to talk about how do you assess management and how do you think about that? And one of the key things I, I talk about is looking at the management incentives. Are the management, are they incentivized on earnings per share or are they incentivized on ROIC? And, you know, companies that are incentivized on return and capital tend to perform a lot better than companies that are not. I mean, you know, there's all sorts of academic evidence of this. And, you know, I go into some of the other things like, you know, if you're looking at a mining company, is the, is the CEO, is he incentivized on the number of accidents, on the number of deaths? And if they aren't, you've got to ask yourself, well, why not? And this whole issue of, I mean, I call that sustainability because that's to me is, you know, if you if you if you if you're not looking after your employees it's not a sustainable business so you you know if you're in a high risk industry you've got to pay very close attention to safety because that at the end of the day means you know the company that is a safe company is a company that will persevere you know bp is a classic classic example of a company which got safety wrong and paid a huge 65 billion dollar price for it so, you know, I think it's important to pay, pay attention to those sorts of things. And then, you know, once I've done all that, I then go in the book, I go through, how do you look at the accounts? Just, uh, just before you move on to that, let's talk a little bit about quality. What's your, what's your definition of business quality? Well, I go through, I think there's, there isn't a definition, right? I mean, you know, if there's a definition, you know, it would be, it makes a return on invested capital above X. But the, the, the problem with the quantitative measures is that I was saying before, the algos have worked all this out. So there's a, a great um, piece by 
Rob Arnett. So you're the Rob Arnett uh, <laughs> fan. So you know, you probably know better than me, but um, they did a great piece and they very kindly let me reproduce a chart in the book. It was an incredibly complicated chart. But the one of the things that they looked at was the Novi Marx paper in 2013 on gross profitability. Right. And they did this paper that said that gross profitability has really worked. But it's actually 90% of the performance has come because the stocks have been re-rated. Right. And what that tells you is that people have worked out. So it was a very effective paper when it came out. But people have read the paper and said, hey, this works. Let's, let's put this into our algo. And so the opportunity for these um, things to continue to outperform and give you excess performance, I think it's highly unlikely that you could find a quantitative measure which will consistently perform that because they've all been they've all attracted so much money that you've got to pay up in order to in order to buy that. So I think yes, you want to make sure that you've got companies that have got that. Um, are a good quality, high ROIC. But the, you then got to start thinking about qualitative measures. And the one thing, you know, if people want to think about one thing they should look at, it's pricing power. Because if you have pricing power, you're safe. So obviously that will manifest itself in a good ROIC, in high gross profitability. But the, there may be situations in which the ROIC today isn't all it might be, but the company's acquired pricing power. And that's really what you want to look at, a company that's going through a fundamental change where it's not got a fancy valuation today, but not only will the profits improve because it suddenly found this pricing power, but in three years' time, people are going to go, oh, man, look at the ROIC. We better buy some of that. And the rating goes up. And that's really what I look for, you know, companies that aren't necessarily in favor today, but could be in favor tomorrow. And obviously, it doesn't always pan out the way you think. But if you've got a portfolio full of those things and you've done your homework, then enough of them will, will pay off that you'll have really outsized returns. And that's what I try and show in the book. How, how are you assessing pricing power? Well, I, I, it's a very subjective thing, isn't it? I mean, pricing power it, to me is when you go into the shop and you buy the product, you wince, but you don't think about buying some, something else. No, oh, you're laughing, but I remember. No, I agree. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just laughing at it. But, uh, you know, I took the family to Florida for a holiday because the kids wanted to go to, to Disney. And I remember going to the agency to buy tickets for the for Disney and all the other things for the week. And when the guy told me the bill, I thought I thought he'd made a mistake. I, I, honestly, I mean, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I thought, put, I thought he'd read it wrong. I thought he had an extra zero. And of course, you know, Disney, guess what? They've figured this out. They figured out that it really takes a lot of uh, a lot of money before you, you, you say no to your kids, right? It's gonna be really, really expensive. So whether it's 100 bucks a ticket or 105 bucks a ticket or 110 bucks, it doesn't really matter. So, um, you know, that's the kind of thing to look for. Obviously, you know, it's well recognized in Disney, but there are other products where, you know, you can see, you can see the businesses are gradually inching the price up. And it's quite interesting. I mean, it's not, this isn't very scientific because you saw, with the iPhone, right? They they kept putting the price up, but when it got to a thousand dollars, there was a there was a pushback, wasn't there? And they then started pushing. Well, I'm not an expert in Apple, but this is my my take on it. Was that they started producing a range of products at different pricing points because they didn't have the same um, take up from their customer base that they thought they would because they thought they could just keep pr putting prices up forever. And look, I can afford $1,000 as a thousand pounds for an iPhone, but I I can afford it, but I, I don't like spending it. You know, and I, I think, oh, well, you know what? I'll just keep it, I'll just keep the phone for another six months or I'll just replace the battery and I'll, 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 I'll replace it next year. And you, so, you know, it's trying to understand where the, where the level is and there's no science to any of this. 
But if you're in, and I know nothing about Apple, so I hope you don't get loads of complaints that I'm talking rubbish, because I may well be. I don't know anything about Apple, but I only know from my own personal observation. But when you start to research a stock and look at it closely, then you get a feeling for, is that the right pricing point? And how close is it to the ceiling? And how much room do they have to increase it further? And obviously, if you're getting in early, then you've got a much better opportunity. If you're getting in late, then you've obviously, you're, you're, A, you'll be paying up, and you'll be paying up in a multiple of the higher price. So, you know, there are very few companies which have got no price resistance amongst the customer base and such a moat that nobody can come in and compete with them. So it's just a matter of trying, you know, it's a matter of trying to understand. I, I try and give some examples in the book of the sorts of things that you should look for. Yeah, Apple has a diabolical approach to pricing where, you know, the, they have an iPad out at the moment for $329, but when you actually end up buying it, it costs you $758. It's very, very clever, very clever pricing, very clever marketing for that particular object. Once you get, so what, what, the way that I think about you, you're the forensic accounting guy who really does like to tear into the accounts and that's, that's where we kind of left the process. So let's go back to that. We're approaching the accounts. What's, the, uh, what's your approach when you, when you start looking at them? Well, you know, most people start off with a P&L. Now, obviously, by the time, I'm, by the time I come to re open the report and accounts, I've already looked not in detail, but I've already had my first tranche looked at the business. So I'll, when I first looked at it, I obviously have looked at the earnings numbers and the, and, and the revenue growth. But when I open the accounts, I start with the balance sheet because a balance sheet is the most important financial statement. It's completely overlooked. It's completely underrepresented in people's efforts. And if you think that there's something wrong, you usually find it in the balance sheet. So I just start off, I, I, I have a very simple procedure. I start off at the top and I work my way down the balance sheet and I go and I, I read every line and I read every note and I ask, well, it, does that make sense? And it's amazing to me that, you know, just by doing that, I, I, I do this in, in, in the course when I do the, the how to read a balance sheet course physically with people I go through and I say I, I use a company that nobody's nobody's heard of nobody knows and I just explained so from this you can tell lots and lots about the company you can tell how capital intensive the asset base is you can tell how much inventory there is one of the companies that I use has got um, a large amount of raw material a large amount of finished products and a very, very small amount of work in progress. I say, well, I've never been in one of these factories, but obviously it's a very short cycle. So they produce their product in less than a day because that's how much is in work in progress. And it's just that, you know, looking at the numbers tells you what's really going on. You don't need to listen. You don't need to listen to the calls or listen to the, read the management stuff at the front of the book. You know, all the glossy pages, you, you get the 10K, so you're not allowed glossy pages. But, <laughs> oh, you know, in, in Europe and in Asia, the accounts are full of, you know, wonderful um, pictures and telling you about the product. I don't even, I, I read that at the end. I look at the numbers because I don't want to get distracted or colored by what the management are telling me about the business and, and, and you know, how great it is. I want to look at the facts. And just by reading the balance sheet, you can tell a huge amount. And, uh, you know, I explained that the audit report is another one. You in the United States had a weird um, thing where we all under IFRS, the auditors had to flag up issues where they'd had disagreements with management. And that's one of the first places I look because the audit report can tell you, I mean, it's like shining a spotlight on where the problems are. It's only December 19 year ends that that started to be the case in the United States. But it seems to be the, the, the auditors just only do one thing, you know, oh, well, Netflix. Yeah, there's a bit of an issue about the content accounting, um, a bit of an issue. But, the, you know, that's, there's a load of tricks to, to, to look at in the company accounts. I could write a whole book about going through the accounts. And 
if this book sells well, maybe I'll write another book. But I'm, it's not something I'm rushing to do. I don't know how you manage to write four books. I mean, I found it a very difficult and painful and lengthy process. Extensive brain damage. You've got to forget about it rapidly after you finish it and then think, you know, that that, that, sounded, that, that wasn't so bad. I think, I think it's like my wife describing to me giving birth. She, she forgot about the pain pretty quickly afterwards and then you've got a kid running around. Yeah. But that's the, but the thing with the, with having a child is that you've got this lovely little bundle of joy afterwards until they grow up and raid your wallet. But the with a book, you know, I I haven't wanted to open. So I, the the book came, you know, the, the the author copies came from the publisher in a big box, and I, I filmed myself opening the box, and I was very excited to see the cover and everything. But I, I haven't wanted to look inside because I'm thinking, you know, when I start looking inside, I'm going to find mistakes. That's it. That's, really that's exactly what I was about so to say. The, I'm, I, I don't think I'll ever. I don't think I'll ever read it. Actually. The only time you that you'll find every single typo the very next time you read through it, now that it's already been published. There was a guy that I used to work with when I was on the south side, and whenever I published a note before the morning meeting, he would rush over and point out the typos. And I thought, you know, you're brilliant at spotting typos. I'm going to give you a draft before it goes out. He never found another mistake. <laughs> Just... <laughs> yeah, that's not very helpful. So balance sheet, uh, what do you advocate then? Are you cash flow, P&L? Where do you go next? Yeah, I mean, I, I start with balance sheet, go through the, well, I start with the audit report, balance sheet, P&L, cash flow. And, you know, do the ratios. And, you know, the, the most time consuming part of all this is going through the balance sheet and going through all the notes. And then um, people don't normally read the accounting policies. And I'm a big believer in reading them because, you know, I'm just on the look at is there anything funny here? Is there anything out of the ordinary? Why are they saying particular things? And, um, you know, people won't want to do that. But I, I do tell my professional investor clients that, okay, you don't have an awful lot of time. You don't want to read the whole accounting policies, but at least read the accounting policy on revenue recognition. There's less subjectivity now because there's IFRS 15 and the SC 606, which are much stricter on how you can recognize revenue. But you still do need to understand, does the company do anything funny? And it's amazing. You know, I was looking at a very successful stock, which has trebled or quadrupled. And I read the revenue recognition note and I, I couldn't understand it. And one of my clients has got a big position. I mean, you know, like over a hundred million dollar position in this stock. And I, I emailed my contact there who runs their U.S. fund. And I said, have you read this? And they said, mm, I'll get back to you. And they get, got back to me and said, doesn't make sense, does it? I said, no. <laughs> no, it's what, you know, it's one of those stocks that nobody cares how much money it makes. Nobody cares how much, well, of course it doesn't, doesn't make a profit. Of course it makes a loss. It's quadrupled, right? But, um, you know, they said, oh, okay. So we've got, you know, when you see that, you know, you've got a problem. So, yeah, and to me, when you've got an issue like that, it doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't buy the shares, but you've got to be much more aware of the risk you're undertaking. You've got to believe that the gain will be much higher because you know there's a lot of risk and you know that you want to be looking for the exit. You know, when you, when you get into that sort of situation, it's not a hold forever. It can't be a hold forever because you know it's not 100% clean. So once you've finished looking at the accounts, what's the next stage? Are we, can we buy yet? Almost. We're almost there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the next stage is obviously to look at the valuation and say, you know, is the valuation sensible? And I go through some of the ratios that I look at. One of my, um, one of my favorites is enterprise value to sales. Right. So, you know, people get very fixated in PE. I mean, some people use PE alone. I, I've never understood how they can do that. Um, you know, because at least um, you must use at least one enterprise value based measure, because otherwise you get distortions from capital structure, you get distortions from tax, 
which are, can be very, very d dangerous and can really come back to bite you. So you've got, always got to use at least one equity based and one enterprise value based measure. And I really like enterprise value to sales because it's a, you know, you're comparing the enterprise value, which is a bigger number, with the sales, which is a bigger number. So it's a much less volatile range. So you can, you know, the, the sell side analysts always talk about, you know, this stock's been in a P of 15 to 17 for the last seven years, and therefore we're going to value it on 16 times earnings. They never look at what the business does or whether it's changed. And they're using such a volatile number. You're much better off using the enterprise value to sales because the sales don't move that much. The sales are much less likely to be a lie than the earnings number. I mean, you know, it's hard to find a U.S. company with an earnings number that isn't a lie, you know, Berkshire aside. <laughs> so using enterprise value to sales is a very, very powerful tool. And then, you know, once I've decided that the valuation is sensible, I mean, I, I won't necessarily abandon something because it's got a high valuation. I mean, you know, you know I, I'm quite happy to pay up for the, the right stock. But often what we would do is we say, well, actually, our target price for this stock is X. So we want to buy it at X minus 30% or 40%, depending on the risks. So we, you know, we'd say, we think it could be worth this. Let's try and buy it at this. So we've got enough of, a, a, in, enough of an opportunity. And then we just put it on the watch list. And when it hit that price, we'd say, OK, has anything changed? And if it hasn't changed, then we'd press the button to buy it. And then, you know, once you've said, OK, now is the time to buy it, the next thing is to communicate that idea. And very controversially, I advocate writing a note. And like I say, I've done I've tested this book because I've done this effectively as an as a course for private investors in London. And when I suggested that people wrote down their idea, they were they were aghast. <laughs> I mean, I have to say these people were not the best investors you've ever met, but they were they were pretty aghast. And I said, look, just do me a favor. You've paid to come in this course. Why don't you just try it? Just, just try it once. And about the next couple of months, they all started emailing me saying, you know what? That's a really good idea. I'm really surprised. And this idea of writing it down is mission critical because when you write it down, you're forced to think through. And I say, look, you don't need to write a 30 page research note. Just think about two things to start off with. The first is, what does the company do? And don't say the company's in the software business. Say the company provides this type of software, which is critical to its customers. It's on a subscription basis, paid quarterly in advance with a 2% churn. And then you understand that's that sounds great, actually. Of, yeah. Well, the, the, you know, when I say that, you want to buy it immediately, don't you? Because you know immediately that's a high quality business. So write a business description which translates the quality of the business that you're buying. And the other thing to do is write the hypothesis. Why do you want to own this stock? And, you know, that hypothesis should be dead simple. Your 12-year-old kid should understand it. Anthony Bolton used to say this, the fide great fidelity investor. You know, if you, can, if you can't explain why you want to own the share in, a, in very, very simple language, the chances are it's not a good idea because the best investment ideas are dead simple. Yeah, I love it. What, was the, what, what are the objections to writing something down? I don't know. I mean, I think people just have the idea that they, you know, just well, buy it. you know, John, John's got a load of this in his portfolio and he's really rich. So, you know, and it's too much of a discipline, you yeah. know, and, and people don't want to be disciplined. But the more disciplined you are, the less mistakes, you, the fewer mistakes you make and the less money you lose. <laughs> and by writing it down, you know, what I say is, look, write down what's going to go wrong. So write down why you're buying it and write down what you think might go wrong. And then when it goes wrong, because, you know, I can guarantee you that one of the things you buy will go wrong. You know whether it's a planned 
error, a planned mistake, a planned thing gone wrong, or something that you didn't foresee. And the thing you really want to worry about isn't the thing that you, you knew this could happen because that's part of your plan and you know what to do then. Yeah, this has happened. I know, knew this was going to happen. It's going to be temporary. I'm going to have an opportunity to buy some more. This is this looks like bad news, but the share price has gone down. It's actually good news for me because I anticipated it and I now have the opportunity to buy some more at an even cheaper price. The thing you want to worry about is the stuff is, you know, the share has gone down because something you didn't anticipate has happened. Then you've got to panic and think, right, what do I do now? Well, you shouldn't panic, but you've got to, you know, you then got to pay attention. You then got to work out that you may need to change your strategy. You got a man but overboard you... moment, as they as they call it. You got to, you, yeah, you don't want to exactly. be, you don't want to be working out what you're doing in the man overboard moment. You want to know what you're doing in the man overboard moment. Well, the, the thing is, sometimes, you you know, something comes from left field that you hadn't expected and you then have to work out what the implications are going to be. So, you you know, you've got to go and do some work. You can always you can always form a judgment. You can always form a judgment as to the new risk reward profile at this new price in this new environment. If it's something that you anticipated, you already know what the risk reward, you don't need to do any more work. So those those two things are, are, are very different. And then, you know, after I've communicated the idea, I just talk about how do you maintain the portfolio? And I talk about, you know, how do you look at the macro? How do you think about disruption? And I put in a final chapter, which I, I wish I hadn't done now because I did, I, I did it in May about, the, about what might happen with COVID-19. And it's, it, it hasn't, I haven't read it again, but I, I suspect it won't have aged as well as the rest of the book. The rest of the book's got a very long shelf life. That chapter, I think, probably, it sounded like a good idea. The publisher thought it was a good idea because they're like, oh, people will want a book that's got something about COVID in it. But actually, we didn't know that by the time the book was published, there would be a vaccine and we're di- looking at a different regime. Well, I hope, that, I hope that's the case. It's, it's the, the, other, the other possibility is that it beca- it's, it's timely for a long time, which that, that wouldn't be great. Uh, Steve, just as we're coming up on time here, is there anything else you want to mention or, is, or you want to let folks know where they can get the book and... So on. well, the book is available uh, at Amazon, all available good bookstores, all good bookshops. But you know, I'm talking. I'm, 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 we're speaking. I'm in London, and the, no good bookshops are open. So you have to go to um, Amazon or Harriman House, my publisher. I've got, um, I've got the book. I've got a discounted offer in the book, and um, you can find me. You know, my website is behindthebalancesheet.com. There will be a competition on there to win a, some signed copies and stuff. And, um, you know, I'm on Twitter at Steve Clapham. But the book, confusingly, my name is Stephen with a PH. And when I was when I was deciding what should be in the cover, I thought I better put my real name because my parents, who are, are sadly have both died, but um, they would have they would have loved to seen the book. And but they'd have been very offended if I put Steve Clapham. And it's such a stupid mistake because when you search Steve Clapham, you can't find the book on Amazon. So you need to put in Stephen with a PH. But everywhere else, I'm Steve and I'm going to have to change my name or something. We'll just hold up the cover one more time and then uh, we'll we'll let folks see. There we go. The Secret Money Method, How to Pick Stocks Like a Hedge Fund Pro by Stephen PH Clapham. The smart money method. The smart money method. Thanks very much, Steve. That was absolutely fantastic. Uh, Look forward to catching up with you again sometime soon. (laughs) 